Jeff session today on private sector leadership. So what is the role of the private sector in driving innovation, ambition in climate and in nature? So we're delighted to have uh, a wonderful panel here today, live from Glasgow at, at COP26. And I'd like to take this time in the introduction to introduce uh, our panellists. So my name is Matthew Reddy. I'm the private sector specialist with the Global Environment Facility, the GEF. And I'd like to introduce our panel here today. Uh, first of all, on my left here, we have Owen Bethnal, the Senior Manager for Environmental Impact and Global Public Affairs with Nestle. We're joined uh, by Mark Engel, who is the Chief Supply Chain Officer with Unilever. We're delighted that Andy Farrow can join us. He's the Vice President, uh, Corporate Affairs and Sustainability at Mars. And people will probably remember the excellent presentation that Kevin Rabinovich from Mars gave on Monday. And then um, we have uh, Maria Mendeluthe, who everybody knows is the CEO of the We Mean Business Coalition. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce the President and Chief Executive of the Global Environment Facility, uh, Mr. Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, um, who is going to open up um, our session today uh, for our panelists. Uh, thank you, Carlos Manuel. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, uh, what a pleasure. Thank you all. Uh, welcome to the uh, GF, uh, GCF uh, Pavilion. Uh, it is great uh, to have you all over here. As I was saying uh, in a previous uh, panel, this COP can, can be a, a landmark moment in, in history for various reasons. One is, I hope that uh, next week we can close an endless chapter of climate negotiations. It's 27 years of climate negotiations. Everybody has been just on negotiation mode and we need to change into implementation, full implementation. So this can be the, the starting point of a new chapter where we can really concentrate on the element of, uh, of implementation. And as we look towards implementation, because wh what do we want at the end of the day? We want to be carbon neutral, nature positive, pollution free, on a base, uh, on a right base approach, meaning that non-state actors non-state actors, commercial or non-commercial, should have a say and a responsibility in how our system should look like in, in the future. There, are, there is a need to expand the way we conceive, uh, conceive uh, multilateralism uh, today. So in order to, to, to get into that asp aspirational future, one of the big challenges, and, and let me correct, um, you all, if you believe that the big challenge is how we mobilize financial resources, um, uh, the big challenge is not how we mobilize financial resources, right? And how do we generate more policy coherence at the deci decision uh, level of, of governments and, and countries? Without more policy coherence, and this means you know, aligning all investment, public and private investment, with the Paris Agreement, with the, bio, the, with the new biodiversity framework, with our aspiration of uh, land neutrality and landscape um, uh, restoration. Without that, we'll never achieve any target because we can mobilize resources at the domestic level, at the uh, ODA level from the private sector to the public sector, that, that will never be enough. We're talking today, this is the, the financial day of the COP, we're talking about mobilizing $100 billion. And it is extremely important to consummate the mobilization of $100 billion. But that is just 7.1% of what we should be mobilizing today from all sources to be on track to the 1.5%. So how do we address with that 93% additional funds that we need. It's not just asking it to the private sector. It's not just asking it to the private sector. It's making the condition for the private sector being 80% of, of the global GDP to make 
uh, climate mitigation adaptation and the right use of nature a good sound uh, business model. And that will never be possible if we have a system that is totally incoherent. We invest, we humans invest 142 times more financial resources in economic activities that, that generates deforestation than what we invest in forest conservation. And that is not reflected in the way we do national accounting or the way we measure success in a company, in a corporation. Pollution continues to be free. But at the same time, we tax everything positive we do in our society. We tax income, we tax, tax transactions, we tax property, but we don't tax those negative externalities. So the big, big challenge is how do we generate that policy coherence? This is the policy co uh, co e coherent element on the economic side. On the public sector structural side, on, with regards to frameworks, we got a major issue there that we need to also to understand. Otherwise, the private sector will never be part of the solution. Uh, we got too many agencies managing too many natural resources at the same time with different ideas. And we have this so, so much strongly embedded in our brain that we don't, we don't think it is possible to have one agency that works on agriculture and environment. We don't think there is any possibility to have an agency that works with renewable and non-renewable natural resources. Why do we divide in so many agencies the management of natural resources? Because that was the old thinking. And that old thinking is what has us with this problem that we want to solve. We need to move from an institutional public framework that doesn't coordinate, that doesn't plan, that doesn't invest together, and that there are all kind of conflicts. By the way, I used to be Minister of Environment in my country, and my biggest challenge were the policies from the Minister of Agriculture. I, I, I cannot say that about the Minister of Energy and Mining because I was at the same time the Minister of Energy and Mining. <laughs> Costa Rica was able to go 100% renewable energy in the electro sector because it brought energy and environment together 35 years ago. So that's a good example on the need to do tra institutional transformation. Otherwise, as we can begin creating the right conditions market-wise, we can, we can invest heavily in leveling the economic playing field that if you don't do those structural reforms in the public sector, we will never achieve those goals of 1.5% or 30%. My point here, is that we will never achieve our sustainability goals with the same institutional framework that in first place create the problem. And that institutional framework continues to generate policies with a sectoral vision, generate a lot of policy incoherence, and will never, never help the private sector be able to be the main force of change and prosperity. Today, we have the opportunity to be here, to work with leaders of the private sector, Today, the Jeff looks at Jeff 8 as an opportunity, as a great opportunity to really work with governments in creating the right frameworks, to work with governments in having those political dialogues based on the best economic uh, uh, data so we can do the adjustment so the private sector can really lead the transformational changes. I don't see the private sector paying the bill. And this is one of the wrong impressions that we have here. We believe that the private sector uh, will finance the transition without us fully recognizing that that won't work. We need to make uh, the 1.5, the decarbonization, the nature conservation, a good, sound, re uh, sound reliable mechanism for, for prosperity and profits. And I think that we are moving from these irrational neoclassic economic models that aims for, to, towards an unlimited growth without the recognition of planetary boundaries towards a more circular economy. And again, I think COP26 can be the, start, the real starting point of change and adjustment. The GEF will be increasing substantially our engagement with the private sector. We had good, good experiences in working with very small 
um, um, efforts to all the way uh, to all the way to uh, global uh, corporations, and we understand that we can play a role beyond working with non-grant instruments, beyond blended finance. We need to be a force of political change, and this is our vision into the future. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you very much indeed, Carlos Manuel, for sharing the direction of the Jeff and the private sector. So let's turn now to some of the more concrete initiatives that the private sector um, has, has been part of. And of course, uh, the race to zero. Hands up, who's heard of the race to zero? Yeah, very good. Um, so over 3,000 businesses, th over 3,000 businesses and 173 of the biggest investors representing the real economy um, have joined 120 countries in committing to net zero by 2050. At the same time, Business for Nature is call to action. Who's heard of the call to action, Business for Nature? Okay, a few less. Okay, that's interesting. Perhaps, Owen, you might reflect a little bit on the call to action and Business for Nature. So that's over a 1,000 companies with revenues of over 4.7 trillion um, calling on a, a policies now to reverse nature loss. So we've never seen in the history of private sector these kinds of commitments. But what does that mean for any specific, com for any specific company or any, or any industry or any sector? And how can companies move from this global commitment to actually achieving things on the ground with local action? That's what we're going to explore today in our session. And I'd like to, uh, first of all, ask the question to Maria Mendeluthe, the CEO of We Mean Business. Should have a mic. What's really driving the private sector? What's driving business to make these kinds of commitments? Hi, okay, fantastic. Thank you, Matt. So for disclosure, so Matthew and me, we work together at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So our history behind the theme of today comes uh, from very far. When he started to work on the um, smart, climate smart agriculture at WBCSD. So Women Business, for those that don't know, it's an organization, a coalition of seven of the largest business organizations working for, with uh, more than 2,000 companies that are committed to action on climate. And um, I have to say that nature has not been at the forefront of the women business activity until, until I have arrived as a new CEO, because it is very clear. I've been working a lot on energy and industry, the so-called hard to abate. And after a good analysis from the ETC uh, commission, I realized that actually the hardest to abate actually is, is food and agriculture. And we don't pay enough attention to this. And so we're going to decarbonize energy and industry because we've been talking about it, the solutions are, but oh, we have a lot of work to do on nature, on food and on agriculture. So we need to, in the next eight years, we need to convert nature from being a carbon source to becoming a carbon sink. And I'm very pleased uh, of the announcements that were made these days, but I'm afraid um, that much more needs to, do, to be done and the frameworks are not there. But from a business perspective, the Science-Based Targets Initiative has launched the last week a standard, it's the net zero standard, because we needed a definition on what should be included in net zero, what is the net part of net zero. So the standard says we need to decarbonize 90% and then neutralize, around 90%, right? and neutralize the remaining emissions. And then we welcome compensation of absolutely everything <laughs> you can compensate. Because climate is a, a budget, it's a stock problem. It's not a flow problem. There's a lot of emissions in the atmosphere that we need to remove. And so, you know, we are asking companies to be net zero and climate positive. And what does it mean? It's not official, we need to do the numbers, but it means that companies should invest around 10% of uh, their emissions in, in, in carbon removals. Um, then I think there's lots of work to be done in helping companies um, to set the frameworks and the conditions for investing in nature. Because companies and many in these rooms are investing in nature, 
but always afraid that there is an NGO that is going to criticize them for investing in nature and, and so call them greenwashing. And come on, guys, I hope that the NGO community is not going to be the barrier for companies investing in nature. Let's be honest, right? I mean, it's just nonsense. Okay, the companies that are sitting here are serious companies that are embarked in a very solid decarbonization pathway. And in addition, they want to invest in nature. So let's welcome that. There's a few initiatives. I need to go, so I'm jumping into the next question, and then I'll have to go, unfortunately, to another meeting. You know how these things are. But, and I'm sorry, because I love to hear <laughs> the panelists here, but I'll, I'll talk to you later. So how can companies um, work together in investing in nature? Well, ideally, the governments will give us some framework, okay? And that's very much needed. It should be included in NDCs. And we have heard from the previous speaker. There is an absence of a clear framework. There is no market for the time being, so there's some voluntary approaches. And, um, and so there's lots of work to be done so that companies can invest and have the confidence that are investing in the right way, okay? And then uh, there's a few initiatives that are helping companies to do that, like the NCS Alliance, the LEAF Coalition, which uh, we should support. And so as any other thing with business, it all starts by measuring and then it's setting targets, then putting in place some actions, then reporting against those targets. And so we need to have better measurement frameworks. The AG protocol has done the land guidance, which is great. We need to have a, a better way for channeling the, the, the targets and then policies that will support this investment. And, and we need you all, the audience, to be very supportive and, and, to, yeah, and to support companies investing in nature because uh, it's very much needed. Thank you. Thank you very much in, indeed, Maria, for that overview and perspective of how and why companies are investing. Let's now take a, a closer look at some of the ways that uh, leading companies are taking on the challenge of, of net zero and nature positive. First of all, um, we'd like to invite Mark Engel, who is the Chief Supply Chain Officer with Unilever, uh, to share his thoughts on what's driving business, Mark, to really uh, get to these net zero and nature positive approaches. Yeah, thank you, uh, Matthew, and thank you for having us here. It's a pleasure. Um, look, I, I think f for us, um, we're a consumer goods company and we're serving about 3 billion consumers around the world. And so for us, the leading voice for change has to be these 3 billion consumers. And um, so there is, of course, a moral aspect to uh, doing the right thing. But let me also assure you that particularly as consumers get younger, so millennials and Gen Z, um, all the research tells us that these consumers will not buy your brands if you're not beyond having a product that's good for them is also good for the planet and society at large. They, they really vote with their wallets. And so uh, I just want to make the business case for it is not just doing the right thing. It's also about the economics. Um, and because at the end of the day, if you still want to have a successful company and keep growing, you need to serve your consumers. And this is very clearly what consumers are saying. Um, we have been at this journey for a long time. We've got um, brands that are very far in this journey and brands that are not so far in the journey. And we're very clearly seeing that the brands that, are, that have a very clear purpose, that do the right thing for the planet and for society, as well as giving a great experience, are just growing faster. So, you know, you have more growth, more market share, stronger brands, lower risk, lower cost as well, because many of the uh, decarbonization initiative is just about reducing emissions and the greenest and, and, and cleanest energy is the one that you don't use. Uh, you know, we've, we have basically um, um, dropped our carbon footprint in our operations by 74% since 2008, and half of that is by just energy efficiency, you know, and that is obviously, there's, so there is a strong economic case. The second one is, um, you know, in, in, in the end of 2020, our board decided to, um, to put our climate transition action plan in front of our shareholders. We wanted to have an advisory vote. We run a multi-stakeholder model, but we were really keen to understand whether our shareholders were on board with our journey. So we put a 34-page uh, climate transition action plan, and we put it uh, at our AGM to a shareholder vote, uh, advisory shareholder vote uh, in May, and we got over 99% approval. So it's, it's also really important to understand that your shareholders are 
understanding why we're doing this and that they're on board with it. And then the third point, and I'm going to echo Maria, is that you know, we, we have been um, traditionally focused on sorting out our own house, sustainable sourcing, uh, reducing carbon footprint, trying to, to drive um, some industry change uh, you know, with other like-minded companies like Nestle and Mars, and we, we, we build coalitions, etc. But the bit that was missing um, was around finance. And when you look at um, decarbonization is very often self-financing. You know, electri uh, electrification is now competitive, green electricity is competitive. But nature needs investment. Um, you know, we think that the biggest carbon sink in the world is Mother Earth. And, um, you know, it could actually absorb a third of all the carbon uh, uh, in the world, but it only receives 3% of the finance. And because it's nature, it takes stuff, it takes time to grow stuff. It is in much more need of finance than the normal decarbonization initiatives in, in emission reduction. So we are also propagating for uh, accelerating the agenda on nature. Yes, of course, it needs to be high integrity and it cannot be greenwashing. But like Maria, I'm absolutely of the view that it's difficult to be against, uh, let's say, investing in nature and restoring nature um, and, and, and uh, let's say, storing some of the carbon that has been released over the last 100 years has got to be the right thing to do. And, and I think this is where, as companies, we want to drive. Um, we have, a, in Unilever, we have an, an, an agricultural footprint of about 4 million hectares. That's about a third of the UK. Um, so that's a significant hectare. So it makes sense for us also to invest in restoring and protecting, uh, let's say, an equivalent of that amount and, and be involved in nature, in forests, in oceans, in agricultural land, and restoration, preservation, um, and, 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 and some of the replanting. So I just wanted to echo what Maria said because we're also very, very much on that, uh, on that streak. Thank you very much indeed, Mark, for sharing those wonderful facts and especially highlighting the role of energy efficiency. I mean, that's, that's a really great thing to bring up and uh, often overlooked. Now, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to our panel today our, our keynote address. Um, we'd like to invite Nigel Topping, the high-level champion for climate action, to share his thoughts on net zero and corporate ambition. Thank you very much, Nigel, for joining us today. So, um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I've been, I've been in this role for just over a year and a half, and uh, so, I've, uh, so I've never done a cop in this role. I've, I've, I've done a cop in the role that Maria has, um, which is pretty mad. And uh, Gonzalo, my, my from Munoz from, from Chile, told me that this would be much madder, and he's right. So, um, apologies for being late, and, um, but... Um, I think this is a very exciting time for, for you know, private sector leadership, innovation and ambition is, it's one of the main themes of this COP. Um, when I spoke at the youth COP in Milan, 400 young people from 200 countries selected out of 8,000 to represent in putting together a set of demands to come to this COP, they, they, they asked me what was gonna be different about this COP. Because, you know, amongst a lot of people, there's a sense that we've been, really, number 26, and you still haven't fixed it? And I said, a um, couple of things are different. This is going to be the first action COP. And the way you can see that is every day of the COP has a different real economy theme. Finance, transport, nature, um, built environment, industry. Um, and the, the, the physical layout is gradually, and again, I have to applaud Maria here, coalescing around stakeholder collaboration. So you have a business pavilion and a finance pavilion and a resilience hub and a nature hub. So both temporally and physically, it's much easier for people who have not been going to 26 cops. Uh, right? and, that, and that's mostly true for private sector. Um, to be able to figure out when to turn up and where to go, um, how to play their unique role, and each of us has a unique role in driving things forward. So, um, 
this is the first action cop and this conversation is a part of that i want i, I, want, I want to thank jeff for um and i think i think with with a renewed vigor i think with some with some changes in in staff of, of how to really act as a systems change catalyst and engage with the private sector in a really creative way um, given your unique role All, also, um, Maria, I have to tell you, I was, I was, I, I, I was just doing, um, you know, we, Gonzalo and I have to meet with all of the negotiating groups to explain all of the work that's going on in the business community and the finance community and cities um, and how it's building momentum. Um, and I just had a conversation just now, and, I, and verbatim, that, and I won't, I won't explain who it was, um, but the head of this negotiating group, a big group of countries, said to me, he said, Nigel, we mean business. So I want you to know that. And then he said, we're all in, which is, Maria, it's your, it's your, 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 your campaign now, all in for 1.5, right? So um, look, we, we know that this sector um, is absolutely crucial, that, that, that um, there's no way we can get to net zero without really big transformation. And that transformation is not possible from civil society alone or finance alone or regulators alone or business alone. It's gonna take everybody working collaboratively. Um, so um, I want to acknowledge all of the leadership of the companies on the panel and many, many more uh, that, that could have taken your place. Um, because in Paris, if we had a leadership panel, we would have had the only three companies we could find who were really leading. And that's one of the most exciting things now. It's whole sectors. It's huge groups. And, and Maria is playing a role in pulling together the kind of at scale transformation. So we're seeing now some of these really big collaborations like IFAC on reversing deforestation or Regen 10. Um, uh, and, and interestingly, both of those have as a theme the combination of private finance, private business, and a very deep respect for the human dimension of the transformation we're talking about. Whether it's, whether it's the smallholder farmers who are gonna have to move towards regenerative practices and will need help doing that and, and should be able to expect higher prices as a result of embasing that, which will affect their livelihoods. Or whether it's the, the indigenous peoples and forest communities who are stewarding forests and need a different incentive structure um, to incentivize them to steward forests rather than, um, rather than deplete them. Um, and, and, and of course, given the leadership at Jeff now, um, you know more about that than almost any organization in the world. So um, what I really like to do today is, is celebrate um, much more connected leadership, uh, which I think is more humble leadership. No one trying to pretend that they can do it on their own. And everyone recognizing that actually being 100 miles ahead of all, the, all of your peers is not helpful recognizing that there's a role for multilateral organizations, for national governments, for indigenous peoples, for every actor along the supply chain from the smallholder farmer to the massive um, uh, agribusiness and consumer goods company. Um, this has to be the way we organize COPs going forward. So that it's really about implementation. So ratcheting ambition every year. That for me is one of the most exciting things. You know, within the Paris Agreement, there's this idea of a five-year ratchet. Well. I don't think there's any business in the world that is gonna wait five years to come up with their next uh, strategy in these areas because things are moving so fast. So whatever your strategy was two years ago, you probably look at it now and cringe because it, it now seems really naive because things are moving so fast. So let's make sure this idea of radical collaboration between public, private, indigenous peoples along the whole value chain um, is at the heart of what we're doing. Finance is a huge, you know, finance, this is the finance day today. We have $130 trillion of capital committed to net zero. That means financing the transition to net zero, particularly in emerging markets, which requires more intellect to problem solve, more collaboration with this sector in particular, which has huge footprint and reliance on, um, on, on emerging markets. So th thank you for everything that you're doing. And um, I'm, I'm sorry I can't stay for the, that's one of the really disappointing things about this role is the really interesting thing is sitting in and listening to everything. But thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nigel, for sharing those thoughts on the action of COP. And we might just do a little bit of seat rearranging here uh, to take this opportunity. Thank you very much indeed, Nigel.
Do you have to leave, Maria? Oh, well, 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 John, may we invite you to take the stage, please? And so, please, we'd like to welcome uh, to the stage uh, John Nile, who is the Nature Based Solutions Lead with Technology Leader Salesforce. People know um, Salesforce. So, we'd like now to turn the question to, to Andy. Andy Farrow, um, who is uh, the VP uh, for Corporate Affairs and Sustainability at Mars. And what's driving Mars? for net zero and nature positive? I mean, I think, I think Mark set out the business case very well. It, it, it is impossible to have well, something I said clearly. Um, <laughs> Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's impossible to have a, have a successful business in an unsuccessful world. And, and climate change is heading towards a hugely unsuccessful world uh, with huge and chronic impacts on so many people. So you just cannot conceive that your business, particularly global business, can be successful a lot for the long term. I think we, we probably got to net zero quite early, but we got it wrong. Uh, and we got there early because we actually focused actually 2008 just on our own operations. And then when you started to map it, so it was early, we didn't call it net zero, it was sustainable in a generation. But when then you started to map it, you, you know, we found that under 10% of our footprint is, is things that we directly control. It's, it, it's overwhelmingly what you would call scope-free emissions, right through from the farmer that grows it to the consumer that, uh, you know, that puts it in a microwave and heats it or uses it, so right the way through. And then 75% of that is in, is in agriculture. Uh, and so it is, you know, and as a company, you know, the supply chain we see is broken. We cannot just issue some uh, uh, specifications and expect them to just roll down the supply chain naturally and we get the sort of things we want. You, you have to have radical, you have to have radical interventions. Um, I think the other critical thing for us is that net, you know, 2050 is great, net zero is great, but the world is not looking for us to really have a great 2049. You know, it matters a lot more where you can get to in 2025, 2030 and so on. And we've, we've, managed, we've managed to break the link in our business between the, the growth of our business, both sales and volume and carbon. So absolute carbon emissions are down, I think about 8%. Since 2015, we want to get down to minus 27% by 2025. And at, at probably before that time, we'll set a 2030 target, which logically has to be between 40 and 50% because we believe it needs to go down. And we, we've also been very much focused on reductions, of course, but you need to do external removals as well. Again, Mother Earth doesn't really care how the carbon is removed. She just wants it, she just wants it removed and she wants it removed quickly. And so I, we see that very much as our approach. I think in some ways we're fortunate that we have a family, uh, a family ownership and the family have a strong desire to be sustainable in the generation. And the way that we see this working is it's one of six shareholder objectives that the family have set. Um, and we see it integrated into our financial planning. So I can with, with certainty point to that we are securely funded in the P&L to 2025 in the same way that we're securely funded on capital investments or future marketing spend or R&D spend. And, it, and it's very much integrated down. It's integrated down into every p and in every country. And that, that ultimately is the way that I see that we, that we, from a business point of view, need to drive it. Now, then, of course, you get then get to when you get to specific, uh, uh, specific raw materials we buy, you know, big ones where you know, you know, on cocoa, on palm, you know, you can't solve it on your own. You can do a certain amount with your suppliers, but you are, you need transformational partnerships between public and private sector. Uh, and we may go on to talk about that later, but I, I think that is absolutely critical. And, and, it, and it, it, you need it so much in agriculture because it's broken. It ain't gonna, it go, ain't gonna work without transformational change. It does involve governments, it does involve companies, but we've all got to work together on it. Thank you so much, Andy, for those perspectives from, from Mars and the accountability that cascades through the organisation to deliver on these results. I'd like now to turn to, to Nestle. Everybody knows Nestle, of course, and um, Owen Bethnal, who is the Senior Manager for Environmental Impact and, and Global Affairs at Nestle. What's driving Nestle's commitment to net zero and nature positive? 
Sure. Well, thank you. Thanks very much for the opportunity to talk today as well. Um, just to reflect on some of the comments made so far, I think for Nestle, there's never been a really big division between nature and carbon because our carbon emissions are two thirds reliant on how we grow ingredients uh, and how we manage the landscapes where we source those ingredients. So you can't get to net zero without having a nature positive effect. Uh, and, and likewise, um, having just a nature positive effect isn't the full solution to, to net zero. Um, so internally, it does create a little bit of confusion when people say you must have a, net, uh, a nature positive target alongside a net zero one because we feel like they're one and the same thing to, to a certain extent. Um, but externally, there is a difference. So if we talk about the driving factors behind making these types of pledge, um, climate is more mature in terms of the uh, investor perspective. So we've had things like TCFD, the reporting framework, which started to be developed in 2015. Um, we were supportive of that. We've just issued our first TCFD aligned report this year. So that's integrating climate into the way we're looking at risk and um, managing the business going forwards. On nature, that kind of process through TNFD is really kicking off now. And Na uh, Nestle is one of the 30 companies involved in putting that framework together. And we're very supportive of it. So, you know, the maturity level's coming on, on, on nature specific disclosures, but it's not quite there as it is on carbon. Um, I think, again, the, the types of questions we get from investors also reflect that different level of, of development. So um, on our carbon roadmap, we're getting very detailed questions about, you know, specifically how are you going to ensure carbon is, uh, is kept in the ground at the farm level? Um, and obviously, that inadvertently, that's, that's going to have an, an impact on nature too, but the questions aren't specifically on that just yet. I think that will come, that will develop as well. Um, and we'll also see that at the political level. We saw some great announcements yesterday on protecting nature and at the same time reducing emissions. And we're supportive of, of that process, things like the LEAF Coalition that Nestle is a member of um, and other multi-stakeholder platforms where we're looking at um, ensuring that when we plant trees, when we reduce and remove carbon, we do it in, a, in the right way that creates a, uh, a, a net benefit for biodiversity, but also for communities and for our, our challenge on climate. So I think there's a big integration between the two things when you're a food company, when you rely on, on, on mother nature for your, for your business, um, and you have to manage the risks associated with that and the opportunities, as Mark mentioned, around consumer demand. But really, it's about, it's about future proofing. Um, and I think you have to be uh, both nature positive and net zero to have a long-term sustainable future in the sector that we operate in. Thanks very much. And for clarity uh, there, when you say the investors are asking you about how carbon is stored in the soil, they're, they're coming at it from a climate perspective. And you, you believe that soon they'll be asking these more detailed questions about nature and biodiversity. Exactly, yeah. And I think there's, there's unique challenges there in terms of measurement. So, um, you know, what kind of benchmark do you use? What kind of framework do you use to measure your, your baseline on biodiversity, and then how do you show that you've improved it? Mm. On, on climate, that's a little bit more straightforward. I mean, it's complicated, but it's, it, it's again, it's just more developed. So um, investors are starting to ask now, you know, um, how would you measure biodiversity rather than what progress have you made, right? right? So I think, uh, you know, it will come, it, it, things, are, things are speeding up, and, and rightly so. And so in, in the short term, uh, next year, I don't know, in, in, in the not too distant uh, cycle in terms of business planning, we will start to get those questions. We will need to answer them in the, in the right way and we'll need to be taking the right actions to, to ensure our investors are confident in our company moving forwards. Very good. Thanks very much indeed, Owen. Uh, now we're going to shift away for a little bit from the, um, uh, the food uh, systems. We're going to turn to technology. I think people are, are very aware of the role of, of leading technology providers. It's our pleasure to, uh, to welcome John Niles from the Salesforce company. People know the Salesforce um, founder, CEO, uh, Mark Benioff, made huge commitments to climate and nature, you know, along with people like, like Bill Gates from the tech sector. And um, there's another guy with a food delivery business who's uh, involved in that as well. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit, John, about technology? Why is a technology company committing to net zero? And what's really driving things within Salesforce? Thank you for having me. And this was a more gender balanced panel. Um, I'm actually sitting in for Suzanne DiBianca, who couldn't make it. But um, 
what's driving Salesforce is um, really our leadership. It's, it's set from the top with Mark's just incredible passion for uh, both nature and climate change. But another key part of it for us is our employees. We have, um, once we acquired Slack, we have uh, 65,000 employees. One in five volunteer or donate or educate themselves through one of our employee initiatives called Earth Force. And there's just to give you a sense that uh, nature is like part of our DNA and climate change is obviously a big part of that. Um, picking up on what Andy said, back in 2015, we made our first commitment to a science-based target by 2050. Uh, by 2017, we were able to um, have uh, net zero for our operations. Um, 2019, we started to add some of our scope three emissions. Um, and just last month, I think as one of the first um, Fortune 500 companies out there, we are now net zero um, scope one and two and three this year. Um, and we're doing a little bit more than just our own, um, taking care of our own house. Um, our government affairs team have, have adopted a policy where um, they want to talk about climate change and regulation and natural climate solutions. Um, our sourcing team who works with all the people that sell to us or want to contract with us. Um, we started a new sustainability exhibit where they need to estimate their emissions, uh, come up with a plan to reduce them, and then also use high quality offsets. So we're trying to inculcate um, climate change, rapid climate change action um, and nature solutions as fast as possible. Um, I'll just add maybe a couple other things. As you know, um, Salesforce and Mark were co-founders of the OneT.org initiative um, to within 10 years, you know, humans, when, when humans started multiplying, there were six trillion trees. Now we have about three trillion trees. Um, so we thought it would just be a good idea within or without outside the carbon markets. Why don't we start bringing a trillion trees back? Um, so we took a hundred million tree pledge um, and there we get to work with partners all around the world. Um, and we've planted, conserved, or grown 43 million trees just in the last two years. Um, a couple other things that, that might be worth mentioning too is we, we do this all through partnerships. Um, so uh, the LEAF Coalition that was just announced is a very exciting way to scale up uh, uh, really high integrity jurisdictional credits. Um, and also the Uplink Challenge, which is where we're sort of fostering the new ecopreneurs, which is a collaboration with the World Economic Forum. So let me stop there and um, Turn it back to you. Thank you so much, John, for sharing these collaborative approaches that, that Salesforce is leading. So we asked the panel this question, you know, what's driving business to do this? We heard from Mark very clearly, it's the consumers who are buying the Unilever products. It's these responses from, from Gen Y and, and Gen Z. We heard that from Mars, it was really around uh, vision. And I think this is something that we, we should really applaud. It's the vision of the owners and, and of the company. Um, from Owen, we really heard about the investor drive, that the investors are really pushing this. And again, from Salesforce, the employees themselves. This is another theme that we hear coming through. So these drivers for business to be nature and net zero, uh, net zero and nature positive are coming from all angles. And it's, it's terrific that we have this range um, of responses here. Now. I'm going to point to this screen here. It's the Slido.com. Slido or Slido? I don't know. But uh, it's Slido.com uh, with that particular code. We're going to ask a question on that Slido, um, and we're going to uh, develop a word cloud from that Slido. So if I could invite people, please, to, to type in. I do have the profanity filter on the Slido, so you have to be really clever if you want to say something naughty. Um, so can we uh, please, Jorge, um, is it possible to show the, the word cloud as its development? Okay. So restoration of ecosystems, solutions, hope, long way. I think people do get that sense of we don't, just need a very good 2049, we, we need a good <laughs> 2021. So some interesting points coming through here. I'm going to actually ask our panellists if they could just turn their heads and just have a quick look here at what's coming up on this word cloud. And pretty clearly, 
there's one word that's standing out there quite quite large above all others and and that's this very positive message of of hope perhaps i'm going to open the floor to any particular speaker who'd like to reflect perhaps on this huge hope signal that we're getting uh, or any of the other points that are coming up thank you now look it is it's great that uh, that hope is featuring so highly but hope is not a good strategy um, and action is, and this is, uh, Nigel was just saying, it's the cop of action. Um, and so I think, you know, there is, uh, and I think also Owen referred to it and, and um, Eddie did as well. You know, we need to make action happen this decade. And so the, um, you know, this is the finance day. Um, you know, we all have factories around the world that need green hydrogen. So, you know, we need to start investing in hydrogen facilities around the world um, to, uh, to further green our operations. Our suppliers need to do the same. We need to, you know, for all of the three companies uh, seated here, um, most of our scope three is with our suppliers, um, you know, or with our consumers as you wash your hair or you, uh, you heat the stuff in the microwave. And so we need to, to have action plans and we need to be very clear where we can use the finance. I think the role of the regulators has got the, because there's also action for the regulators. Um, I think they need the, 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 the policy harmonization point um, is really important because it creates a level playing field for business, but business will also drive innovation, you know, and there is a lot of innovation required that then drives finance because I'm really worried that the current business uh, economic model um, that we are running needs to be disrupted if we're going to make this happen. So. Hope is great. I think all of us are very positive, um, but we do need action because hope alone is not a is not a good strategy. Yeah, you saw you saw that actually as you spoke, the 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 Unilever mass ranks were typing in, and <laughs> as you said it, action suddenly appeared. Um, so you know, that, 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 I, mean, I think it is a, it is a combination. It really is a combination of both. Um, I think hope is about believing it is possible. Uh, but action is what will take it possible. I think for me, one of the most remarkable things, I, you may not sound it, but I'm, a, I'm American now. Um, and living in the US through the, the previous presidency where the president effectively said, you know what, we're, we're, not, we're not going for the Paris Agreement, we're, we're moving away from it. The reality is that most corporate actions in America and most local government actions in America carried on regardless. I genuinely believe that we are we are on a trend and it's going in the right direction and it will move like this and there'll be bad days and there'll be good days but we are really we are we are really getting there because fundamentally you've got big big companies we are you know we have the, we have the carbon footprint of a small country I think it's Panama we ca calculated it as um, uh, and and if you see that action consistently being taken it it is gonna it's gonna achieve good and positive things. Thanks, yeah, I mean, I, I can only agree with the comments made by my colleagues so far. Um, and I think, um, I think hope is good. Uh, I think, uh, you, you know, you feel a bit of despair sometimes in the climate movement that things are not going in the right direction. I think it, within the company that I work for, I went through a process myself of going from um, a little bit of despair to lots of hope. Um, and that helps motivate me, and I think it motivates our employees to, to make our carbon uh, net zero roadmap a reality um, and to you know, future-proof the business, as I said before. So I think um, we're moving into the action phase. Uh, most, most, if not all, of the companies here, I think, have left peak carbon behind. We're on, the, we're on a downward trajectory. Um, the world is not on a, a downward trajectory yet, needs to be. So if we can help inspire broader action and, and show the way to a certain extent, I think that's that's a great way of providing people with hope. And uh, that's one of our roles as, as consumer-facing organizations. Uh, perhaps we could ask you, John, to reflect from the, from the tech perspective. <laughs> I, I was in the NGO and the negotiating world for a very long time. I, I, I joined the private sector about a year and a half ago. And um, it, it gave me a lot of hope to see like the, just the ethical basis of moving forward. Um, when we look, we obviously follow the mitigation hierarchy as best we can, but when we need to go find nature-based solutions, we 
have kind of a very strict command to um, some of the other words up there were, were greenwashing and integrity and verification. Um, we take really seriously how we try to support communities um, and find really credible uh, carbon offsets on credible standards with credible methodologies. Um, so I think for me, it's very hopeful to see that within at least our company, we've been given the, you know, kind of the absolute, please find the highest quality in initiatives and partners to support. Um, and I think we need to see a lot more of those. The, the carbon market is, is definitely hitting sort of a bottleneck right now with a lot of these new corporate commitments. Um, and there's always gonna be residual emissions that need to be taken care of. Um, carbon credits have been that for a long time, and I think there's some very exciting conversations about how the private sector could um, do more um, rather than just offsets. Um, and clearly we need to see um, a lot of new ecopreneurs and new partnerships um, emerge. And we're very much um, like in a listening mode here. We're, we're hoping to hear other great ideas from people that are out there about how we can play a positive role. Yeah, it's great that you raised this point of ecopreneurs. I think that's another strong theme of action and building from the grassroots. And leads us to our final question for the panelists. Um, we'd like to now to turn to this, this question of collaboration. We mentioned radical collaboration, new ways of doing things that reflect new business models rather than the old business models. Uh, I'd like to start with you, Mark, if, we, if you don't mind, that uh, perhaps you know you could share some light, uh, shed some light on what's Unilever doing, perhaps, in some of these new ways of working, uh, collaborations with, say, multi-stakeholder platforms, because I think this action can't be done by any one company by themselves. Yeah, I think that is indeed the learning that, uh, you know, no one can get there alone, and that's also the theme of this week, and I think partnerships are really important. Um, I think, first of all, partnerships with your competitors. Uh, be much clearer about what, what is competitive and what is not. Uh, partnerships with uh, the likes of yourself, because we're going to need finance. We, we've launched this One Billion Climate and Nature Fund uh, coming from our brands. Very interesting, because it's actually money com coming from brand advertising that our brands are going to put into climate and nature restoration projects. Um, you need NGOs, you need uh, uh, multi-stakeholder organizations, we need financiers um, to, to co-fund that. And so, you know, there is the, the, you need your suppliers to get on the journey. So we've launched something called the Climate Promise with 56,000 suppliers, because if you don't get your suppliers on the same journey, um, then to Andy's point, our, our own carbon footprint scope one and two is only by 3% of the total footprint. So you need to, to get the value chain to move as well. Um, and, and so for all of that, you need partnerships. You, you, you need to build programs, you need to build partnerships. Uh, it's absolutely key. And you know, one of the things that we discovered is that at Unilever, we need to really work on ourselves to be good partners because it's not, not always obvious. I think the tech industry is much more used to, to real uh, partnerships. And this is something, it's, it's, it's a muscle that needs to be developed everywhere, but it's a necessary muscle because without it, we won't, we won't make it. <laughs> Very good. I'd um, like to turn to you, Andy. How, do, how does Mars flex its partnership muscle? What's, the, what's the, some of the approaches that Mars is leading in these multi-stakeholder platforms to drive some of this action? I mean, when we looked at our scope for emissions, the overwhelming majority we are in agriculture. And so we looked at the top 10 things we buy that have a, have a, may have a climate impact, but also have a water impact, a human rights impact. Um, and then we have, been, we have been very focused on those, really, um, raw material. By, I mean, part of the problem, actually, I, I keep having to stop saying the word commodity because that's part of the problem. They are treated like interchangeable commodities and they're, uh, and they're, and they're, and they're not. But that these, and then you look raw material by raw material and look at what is the theory of change that you can do it. So on something like palm that we buy a relatively small amount of, we were able to radically simplify, you know, go from you know, 1500 mils to under 90, we should get to under 20. And when you've got that, you can have much better verification. 
so you, you, uh, on things like cocoa that we buy an awful lot more of, you, you can't do that because, because again, it's overwhelmingly so it's overwhelmingly smallholder agriculture. So there, it's okay. You look at Cote d'Ivoire, you look at Ghana, you know, we, and we have a range of partnerships with with, with other players uh, in our industry, with governments as well, because these are systemic problems that we are. That, 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 that we're trying to address. Similarly, on human rights in Thai fishing, and not a climate issue, but a, but a real human rights issue. You know, how, how do you how do you get that societal change? And it's and it's you do it from the from the ground up. Uh, often on a country basis, and and the, there the partnership with government and so the and the transnational actors is incredibly important because. Uh, on the whole, you cannot you you cannot fix it. You cannot fix it yourself. So I think you just need to be you need to be very focused. And from our point of view, certainly on the climate one, you go after the really big areas. On human rights, you have to go after it everywhere because you can't say it's a small bit of human rights problem there. We're not dealing with. It. We're going to do the big one. But on climate, it's a real 80-20 rule. I think. Th thank you, Andy, for sharing that perspective. And I think it's a very good point that you raise this question. Um, that we have of equitable transitions and looking after those people that are producing, uh, and I shan't use the word commodities, the, the things that we all consume as consumers every day. Um, let's now consider then perhaps some of this linkage to NDCs, nationally determined contributions. You know, NDCs, of course, cover greenhouse gas mitigation, but in addition, the adaptation point, which is often forgotten, and that's one of the things we'd like to emphasise with climate and nature. Perhaps from the Nestle perspective, Owen, what is Nestle doing in terms of partnerships and perhaps considering this NDC question and actually contributing to measurable reductions? Sure, yeah. So I would say our kind of simple call to action when coming into COP is to move from agriculture being perceived as, as, as one of the big problems to being one of the big potential solutions. And the way that that solution can be driven is through full incorporation into NDC plans. Um, and using a kind of food system approach to, to say, how do we actually leverage that as a, as a force for good and a way of getting to net zero quicker than maybe we can imagine right now? So to give you a couple of examples, um, our team in the Philippines uh, launched their net zero plan recently. And uh, as a result of that, the government of the Philippines became very interested in what we were doing. And we're now working together on sourcing ideas from young people on how to fast track their NDC program. So they, they've done a workshop a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, just an ideation session, bringing new voices, diversity into the conversation. And uh, I think that's a really nice example of where we just sort of created a spark of interest through, through being proactive on the climate issue. Um, and I think we'd like to see more of that going forward. So even developed countries, and uh, you know, there's, there's issues with the incentives in the agriculture system which prevent it being fully integrated into NDC planning and we need to see that addressed as well through um, the right policy levers being pulled. Uh, thanks, Owen, for raising that question of the youth, a, a strong theme again through this conference. Our CEO, Carlos Manuel, was just addressing the Youth Climate Conference that was held before this event and we know that the youth are, are really part of this drive for um, net zero in action. So, John, you know, as a tech company, you appeal very strongly to that younger demographic, and I know that Salesforce is doing a lot in fostering uh, these kinds of exchanges and, and um, uh, partnerships, if you can call it that way, with, with this particular demographic. Yeah, we, I think probably the most exciting thing that we've done, I guess there's two of them, is the, um, the Uplink Challenge with uh, the World Economic Forum, where you'll hear different challenges. We just announced the winners of a carbon challenge. Um, we're supporting an ocean challenge as well, where I think what we're trying to do is sort of democratize the partnerships that are out there. I mean, we, uh, we would be ex naive and misleading to say that um, partnerships start from an equal basis. The Global South um, and marginalized people just are not, they're not even hearing the notices that the partnerships are happening. They're not at the table. They're not setting the agenda. Um, so what we're trying to do, and I, I think we still have a long way to go, is how can we um, really surface those small initiatives, um, those voices that haven't been heard, um, those ideas that are out there um, that need to be supported, um, we often see the large institutions, the large environmental groups, um, the large think tanks out there, 
and they have a really important role to play. Um, but we're really excited about how we can surface and support um, some of the smaller, less noticed groups that are out there. And I'll just add one one thing to that. In our blue cor blue carbon work, um, which we're going to be announcing an uplink challenge for. Every mangrove has its own land use challenges, its own governance issues, often its own language, its own title um, dynamics. So th there isn't a single solution that kind of can be applied across the whole thing. So we actually, to solve, say for instance, the mangrove or the blue carbon issue as best we can, we actually need to engage communities that we've never spoken to before. So um, that's one of the initiatives that we're working on to try and do that. Thanks, Joe. I think that's a really critical theme, the empowering role of technology for inclusivity and to build some of the marginalised voices and give them access to the ways of decarbonisation and building um, adaptation and resilience um, in their work. Uh, we're coming to the end of this session now. I'd like to thank everybody in, in the audience for their contributions. I, I might just close by saying that it's a delight that we've had such great leadership and real leadership. I think that's evident from what you've said here today uh, around the work that the companies like Unilever, Nestle, um, uh, Salesforce and Mars are doing. Um, and we look forward to following these further announcements. Really look forward to thinking about this uplink. Perhaps uh, people can um, speak with John afterwards about the uplink and mark this um, nature fund. Have I got that right? The climate and nature fund? the Climate and Nature Fund, so we really look forward to hearing more about that from Unilever. Could we then please thank our panellists? A big round of applause for, for, for participating today. Thank you.